because adversity is often the breeding ground for development. Dive into neurointerventional stories, the uncensored interviews. Our guests, all leaders in the field of neurointervention, share the difficulties they face, the complications they have had to manage, and speak without filters on little discussed, sometimes controversial, or simply taboo subjects. Hi everyone, my name is Nantia Suchichantrarat, and today I have a pleasure of talking to Dr. Ribo. Dr. Ribo, how are you today? I am great. Happy to be here. So we want to get started this year, a little bit more general of a topic. The theme is INR, Uncensored Story. So we're going to talk about anything in their journey that even though it's a little bit harder, a little bit more controversial, we can discuss anything here. So I'm going to start by saying, you know, now we know you as big trialist, putting out a lot of really good ischemic research, but take us back through time. Who were you before? Okay, so I've been practicing in the field for more than 20 years. I came to this field when thrombolysis was the big hit. And because I started my residency pushing TPA in patients, I got attracted by acute stroke. Until today, I've been working in making practical science applicable to our patients. And this is when you train in the U.S. as well, right? You spent a couple of years at UT Houston, is that correct? And that is, that is correct. You did, you did some research. I did research, yeah, uh, yeah. Houston is a fantastic city, place to live when you are around 30 years old. <laughs> uh, the medical center is uh, huge, amazing, full of opportunities. I have nothing but great memories. How did that process come about? Why Houston? So when we started doing thrombolysis during my residency, we were monitoring with TCD the MCA of the patients or the occlusion. And uh, one day at a congress, at an international stroke conference, we were presenting our poster. And this Russian doctor, uh, Andre, came to us and he, he told us, guys, you are doing the same thing as, as we are doing, but we are doing this in a trial because we want to show that ultrasound enhanced thrombolysis and why don't you participate in our trial? So we started collaborating with uh, Andrei Alexandrov. We participated in the clot bust trial. We included uh, lots of patients in that trial that was positive. Now we don't always remember, but sonothrombolysis works. The effect as compared to thrombectomy is milder. You need uh, an expert sonographer, so some limitations, but sonothrombolysis worked. It was uh, one of the first trials that was positive. Is that sort of uh, your introduction into the trials world? I think so, yes. This way of thinking, I got it with Jim Grora, Andre Alexandrov, how every single patient, if possible, should be included in a clinical trial. Uh, when we work in this kind of big research, academic institutions... This is uh, one of your duties, to advance knowledge through clinical trials, including patients. So, yeah, it's a kind of obsession that not only we treat the best that we can, but we also try to include in one or another clinical trial. So then after you're done with that fellowship, you came back to Spain. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Uh, but it was not a simple uh, decision. It's not a simple? Okay. As I Tell told you, more. Houston was fantastic. I uh, had great job, great friends, very nice city, very lively. And uh, it was a, a difficult decision. I decided to go back, but I always left the door open. Maybe I would come back to the States. But, <laughs> <laughs> but now, 20 years later, I, I, I didn't come back, but I, but I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind. And back in Spain, yes, at that moment, yeah, it was, uh, again, the starting of thrombolysis, of stroke networks. We created the first telestroke network in Spain. But yes, I had a lot of activity in generating this regional network. My mentors in the area of Barcelona also taught me that it is very important to succeed, to work in a network 
in which you collaborate with your neighbor and you will get better success and results than if you compete with your neighbor. So for the last 15 years, we are known in Catalonia as a network of centers that are very well organized with good results in research. Now, what was the landscape like regionally when you came back? You said 15, 20 years ago, is that right? Was there a lot of a collaboration at that time? Mr. Clean was just 10 years ago. So before 2010, in the area of Barcelona, you had uh, large centers, but each of them was really looking inside and having his own projects. And we were more or less successful. Then in 2012... Dr. Davalos, with the help of Dr. Jovin from the U.S., they put together this Rebascat trial. Rebascat was one of the five trials that proved the safety and efficacy of thrombectomy, but we were recruiting into Rebascat trial since 2012. But the fact that this trial changed the mentality, as I told you, we stopped thinking for our own profit and we start collaborating in this network similar to the Mr. Clean in the Netherlands. So that was the origin of probably the modern Catalan network in which we all were very proud to accomplish and to participate and to include recruit patients following the same protocol. That was the first project that was successful. We published the results a few months after Mr. Clean. Yeah, not only we helped proving the efficacy of thrombectomy, but we generated all this background that in the next years led to other projects. Looking through everything that you've done so far, it's a remarkable accomplishment, of course. I'm very interested in how RaceCat and AngioCat came about. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So once we secured that uh, thrombectomy is an indication, then the next step was to make it possible and equal access to everybody everywhere, but in our case in Catalonia. And if you work as an interventionalist and you are used to wait for your transferred patients, it seems to you that this is an eternity. It, uh, <laughs> uh, but we don't yeah. take many times. We, we assume that this is like this. And, and since we are not responsible of what happens outdoors, many times nobody takes responsibility. Here as a network, and because we have a central office in Catalonia that is designated by the health authorities to take care of this issue, we decided to tackle this problem and also to answer the question, is it when you have a stroke far away from a comprehensive stroke center, is it like it seemed obvious at that time, just bypass that center where you cannot get a thrombectomy and go straight to the thrombectomy center. So that was the origin of RaceCat. The surprise was that we learned <laughs> that not all these severe stroke patients, even if they are pretty well triaged, they will not all need a thrombectomy. Not everything is a thrombectomy. There are hemorrhages, there are patients without an LVO, there are patients that will benefit from very early TPA and they will recanalize during the secondary transfer. Basically, RaceCat showed us this and showed us that what is really important is a very good coordination between the levels of care, paramedics, primary stroke centers, and the hubs, and achieve really short workflow times, very short or in or out times. And this is the most important, and that benefits the whole range of patients, the hemorrhages, the large vessel occlusions, and the mimics, and the, mm -hmm. all the suspected strokes. And then how did that transition into angiocath, which is a positive yeah, that is uh, Trying, uh, right? uh, the second part is what happens inside your hospital. And if you think about it, we spend a lot of time acquiring imaging that many times it's nice to have, but many times it does not help you to make a decision. It gives you a prognostic. If you have a large core, yes, you'll probably have a worse probabilities of good outcomes, but you are still, and now it's more and more clear, you are still a candidate for thrombectomy. So why don't skip all these un strictly unnecessary steps and go only towards what is strictly necessary, to rule out a bleed or not, that that you can do in the angio suite with a conbeam CT, and you can routinely get door to groin pan of around 10 minutes, 12 minutes, if your system is well trained. And this is what we showed with AngioCAT, that skipping what we call conventional imaging in selected cases when the team is ready leads to better outcomes because you cut 20, 30, 40 minutes in the in-hospital workflow times.
So we'll shift gear a little bit and let's talk about some of the challenges that you have faced in the field. You could take this question however you want. What was the biggest challenge you have had in your career? Well, the biggest challenge was to get trained as an interventionalist. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, 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 because... Uh, now, were you the first in the region that was Interventional trained? neurology, yeah. yeah. At that time, and still in some places in Europe, it's not possible to become an interventionist if you are not a radiologist. I was really determined to <laughs> perform these procedures, and I tried my way a little bit out of the system. I got a decent, proper training, not as formal as it is right now, but I had to find my way to get trained, and I had my arguments, uh, discussions <laughs> with some people that did not agree with this. Now, now I think it's less of a problem. In Spain, we have 35 interventional neurologists, and it's growing, and in many other countries. So it's, for somebody from the U.S., it, it might be still surprising that we talk about this, but it's enriching that you have interventionists from different backgrounds in the same team, and you put together different points of view, I think it can only be a good thing to have different backgrounds. But that was a challenge 15 years ago. We're going to wrap up with the last three questions that we ask everybody. First question is, if you can take a journey through time and we went back 10 to 15 years, what would you have done differently? I'm pretty satisfied with how things went. I work with a great team of collaborators. Of course, we have uh, daily problems, sometimes big problems, but no, no, I, I, I'm happy I'm working where I am. I don't think I would change something major. And if we fast forward 15, 20 years, how do you imagine the field will evolve? So I think evolution of the field of acute ischemic stroke is thrombectomies are going to be done in many more places at a much higher volume. We'll have more dedicated devices for different occlusion locations, occlusion nature of the clot, and hopefully we will be combining with neuroprotectants. That is, I think, going to happen. It must happen in the next year, combinations of neuroprotectants I, I think that we still have an amazing way in which we're going to have many more successful events. Aptol is an interesting molecule that I am involved with. It's a neuroprotectant. We showed really nice results in an early phase. We're looking forward to confirming a larger trial. This is one of the challenges. Uh, yeah, exactly. All the process takes a very long time. Yes, but I'm, sometimes, I'm looking... <laughs> sometimes uh, yes, you wish it would go faster than, <laughs> than it is possible. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing how that will turn out. And in the last question, if we now turn our attention to the training of the interventionalist coming out, what do you think we're not saying or doing enough for the future generation today? To train, I think at some point we will have to have dedicated people trained to treat stroke. Basically, no, I'm not saying exclusively stroke, but predominantly stroke. And we have to acknowledge that not everybody should treat everything endovascularly. I mean, some procedures that are not so frequent, they probably shouldn't be done by anyone, eh? anybody. And that is how I see it. We need a huge workforce of people training ischemic and not so many other procedures. So the idea of subspecialization within our specialty. Exactly. Totally, okay. totally agree. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. It was a <laughs> pleasant time. Thank you.